Okay, so for those of you that are online, I don't know who is online or if they can see us. Hello? I'm assuming it's coming through that camera back there. Uh, let me just remind everyone here that this is being recorded, so if you ask questions, you're giving implied consent to have your voice recorded. Uh, do you want to <laughs> start with an acknowledgement? Oh, and you probably have to use a microphone, I guess. Um, Instead of talking into your chest. Yeah. <laughs> Is this one? Oh, yeah, you can hear me. Oh, Mano Gigajeb, Shungila Wanka and Dishnakas, Neashin Nigaming and Dodem. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Russell Johnston, the Indigenous Student Services Coordinator. I want to thank you for joining us here on the traditional lands of the Kosupsum and Lekwungen families. Um, due to their, their wonderful caretaking of this land and these spaces, we have the honor of being visitors here today. Um, and I think as we think about um, the gift of being able to think and to be and to discuss certain ways of knowing and being. Um, it's an honor to do that on these lands and these territories and to be given that gift of thought and idea and discourse and all of the things that we have the privilege of being. Um, so as we get to share this space and to, to honor those that have been there before, um, I will introduce Sean Wilson to join us today and to have a talk. So thank you all for being here and thank you all for being up there also and around and wherever you are. <laughs> Miigwech, we're grateful. Hey, hey. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, now there's a crowd here and we were talking a little bit about how we're gonna do this with the live streaming. So I thought it might be easiest if, um, People in the crowd, if you want to talk and stuff, use one of the microphones that we can pass around. Um, and other, the people online, we may just save your responses till more towards the end when we shift in discussion mode, just because it just makes it a little bit easier. Because I can't, it's hard for me when I'm talking to see who's asking questions online. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that's okay with people online. Um, well, I got my notes up here, and I forgot my password. If you ever notice, if you try and type your password slowly, you can't remember what it is. Okay, um, so I was thinking I should stand up here and read a paper, but I thought, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to start by starting to read a paper and just to see what you guys would do. <laughs> uh, but I didn't have a paper that I could start to read from. So, um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to also acknowledge the, the uh, territory that we're on here and the traditional custodians of these lands. And um, also just acknowledge the territory for and the land itself for what it has to, um, to teach us. Uh, and all we have to do sometimes is just to stop and listen listen for the lessons that the land has for us and uh, we, can, we can learn a lot that way. Uh, so I may start by introducing myself a little bit better. Um, so some of you know me already. Uh, for, for those of you that don't, I'm Sean Wilson. So I'm from a Pasquat Cree Nation which is more towards the center of the universe than where we are here over on the periphery of Vancouver Island. Um, so right in the, if you imagine the middle of North America and you just go up a couple hundred kilometers and you'll be in um, a Pasquat Cree territory. So it's kind of on the border of Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Um, so some of the relationships that I'm in and the responsibilities I hold are, you know, as a husband and a son and brother, cousin, all those sorts of things. Great, great, great grandfather, although those ones aren't born yet. Uh, a researcher and a teacher and a community psychologist. Um, I also have been sort of pretty lucky in that I have had 
uh, what I think is a blessed, blessed upbringing in that um, both my parents had university educations. So it was kind of easy for me or easy, easy decision for me to go to university. I would say it's like in our family, it was kind of equivalent to most people don't stop and think about whether they're going to send their children to kindergarten or first grade. That's kind of like how it was for us with universities. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even something you stop and consider. And I know that that's a lot different than it is for a lot of Indigenous people. So um, you know, I'm thankful for my parents for that. So I had a good sort of uh, upbringing in that it, it um, was able to bridge both worlds. So I, um, learning how to engage and be successful in mainstream society, but also a right stream society, and also to uh, uh, was lucky to also be able to engage culturally in um, Cree society. So that is sort of the one of the big things I think that I bring to discussions around research and ontologies and methodologies and all that sort of stuff is the that uh, I guess biculturalism. Um, so that's a picture of my three boys there back when they were like two and five and eight maybe. So it's a, a big difference from of course how they are now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and any with you with teenage kids will know that that's probably a bit, a little bit more accurate portrayal of what they're like most of the time. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about research and start think, getting people thinking a bit about how research needs to get, be done. Um, but I guess that I really want to get across also that, you know, Indigenous people have been doing research for thousands of years. Like, we wouldn't have been able to survive in the harsh environments that we live in um, without doing research. So we have always been able to learn from our environment and do it in a scientific way. So if you start to think about what science is, it's just a uh, systematic way of understanding. So it's the system behind your knowledge. So that's all science is. So Western science is the Western system behind knowledge. Indigenous science is the indigenous systems and thoughts, uh, philosophy and whatever behind uh, our knowledge base. So just keep that in mind as we're going along. Um, so traditional I indigenous knowledge is a science system because it is does have a structure behind it. Um, oh, and I so this is I've mostly just got pictures here, and they're um, well, some of them tell stories, some of them don't. <laughs> so this is, I think, a, a sort of an example of you know this intergenerational transmission of knowledge. So it's like the, those uh, back in the old days. That's how we used to get around by dog team, and so that's my dad. Uh, with, a, I think it's his dog team, but I'm not sure if it's his or not, but at, uh, in Moose Lake, um, where my parents met when they were, were both teachers back in the 1800s or whenever it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 1960s. <laughs> uh, and then, so the, the other picture is a picture of, so there's my dad also with my brother teaching his granddaughter how to, how to, um, how to work with dogs. Uh, anyway, so knowledge is something that it is uh, passed along. Sorry, I've, also, I've got my notes on a separate screen and I've got that on. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it, what an indigenous research paradigm is and also a bit about why we need one. Um, but I guess when I go through this, um, for me, there's a big problem in the pedagogy of how I go about ex describing this because I needed to, to relay this information in a culturally appropriate way. Um, but the structure of the way discourse works, and you know, as I'm trying to articulate this knowledge, is you know, there's like, what's the role of me as like if I think of myself as a storyteller and y'all as listeners. How does that, how does that work? So that's a little bit different than me. Well, I would like to do things differently than me standing up here and doing a lecture, but it's really hard, especially when you're in a blended environment where some people are here in person, some people are online. Um, 
and also the sort of cultural expectations that people bring into a space like this where it's not generally culturally expected that you're going to have sit down and just have a nice chat about the things that we're talking about. So I guess I wanted to maybe break this up a little bit, but it's going to be a little bit different as well. So hopefully you just keep an open mind and, and go along with the flow. So hopefully everyone has some a, a pen and a piece of paper with them. Uh, if you don't, you don't need to write this down, but it'd be nice if you could start writing some of these things down. Um, so I want, there's, I want you to start to answer a couple of questions. So um, start to think about, can you list the four main assumptions of your research paradigm? So go ahead and write, make yourself a list. These are assumptions behind my research paradigm. And seeing as you're all academics and researchers and graduate students, you should be able to rattle these off in about two minutes. <laughs> so those of you online, hopefully you can be doing this as well. Yes, and use your phone to write them down too. That's good, actually. Text your children what your assumptions are behind your research paradigm. Or post them on Facebook or Twitter. This is what I believe about research. Hashtag research paradigms. Everyone's busy here in real life uh, and hopefully online writing these down. Uh, I'll go on to the next one. So can you explain your worldview? So can you write maybe like a couple of sentences about your worldview? So what's the, under, the philosophy underlying why you do things? Yes, so hopefully, they, hopefully, yes, it's very much related to your research paradigm, but it may not be. <laughs> I know a lot of people believe one thing and they think that they have to do something totally different when they do research. So if you could write this, write something down, that'd be good. And that only needs to be two sentences, right? Because you can all explain your philosophy pretty easily. All right, so now maybe as you're writing your little essay here, we go on to talk about, you know, um, how's your worldview reflected in your beliefs about research? So just what Hillary was saying, it's like, you know, those should be more or less congruent, or not necessarily congruent, but they should be interrelated. So can you start to maybe write a paragraph about how your philosophy is interrelated with your research beliefs. Uh, nope, that's Bald Rock, which is in close to Tenderfield. Oh, sorry, there, on those of you online, there was a question where that picture is taken. Oh, that's my dad, actually, yeah. Seeing if he can move that rock. <laughs> you know, I was trying to think, because you may have seen my dad walk around campus the last couple of days, and he's getting long in years now, so he, he, his mobility is not what it used to be, so he has to take frequent little breaks as he's especially going up hills. So I was thinking, is him, is he, because uh, that's at the top of a great big rock, is he uh, actually just stopping to have a breather? But I think he's actually trying to see if he could move that rock. <laughs> yes. So he believes that he can move that rock, so it's going to impact his research paradigm as he figures out how. <laughs> okay, so all of you have written a little essay on this, right? Okay, 
So when so I'm just going to go back to the to the questions again, and, and so we can sort of explore these a little bit, because whether you realize it or not, these are the things that we ask Indigenous students to do all the time, in our classrooms and um, as we go about engaging with Indigenous knowledge. We expect Indigenous students to be able to answer these questions really easily or to engage in discussions around them. And I don't know about you, but did anyone have a hard time answering any of those questions? I'm thinking probably all of you did, but like, those are really, really hard questions. And if you've never really stopped to consider them before, uh, it's hard. <laughs> but I mean, so those of you that have a PhD or are doing a PhD, hopefully, you know, that's what it is, a doctor of philosophy. But I think a lot of um, PhD programs don't actually get to, you to examine your own philosophy. They start to think about, you know, philosophy is something that's out there rather than philosophy that's something that's, <laughs> that's inside of us and that we're, um, you know, we're constantly working with. And, and especially as we do research that the way we think about things impacts. So it's like even the way you start to ask these questions and answer these questions reveal something about yourself like if if uh, you break down that question a little bit like what are the four main assumptions of your research paradigm well, all right for well, first a you're assuming that there's, we're going to be dealing with things in a numerate way so we can number things also that they're going to be hierarchical so you're already starting to think about oh actually do i do my assumptions and values have a hierarchy so that i can number them one to four and number one is going to be better than number eight or number 12 or whatever so it starts to reveal that you know you, there's a hierarchy involved oftentimes in how we think about things right um, so also I asked specifically asked you to write these down right so we're also then they're assuming that writing is our main form of communication um, it also assumes a cult uh, that, that we're sharing a cultural language a, a common language that we so there's cultural meaning behind all of those words so it's assuming we share that language as researchers, we do this all the time, and as academics, we think everyone's talking the same language, even though we're speaking English, a lot of the words we use don't mean anything to most people. Um, okay? Uh, so, explaining your worldview, oh, to me, this is uh, part of white privilege is that most um, white scholars don't ever have to explain the worldview. Because it's like take, just taken for granted that everyone else has the same worldview and that everyone else knows what it is, so you don't ever have to explain it. Um, so it is an extra, extra burden put on indigenous students and international students and Anyone that shares a different, that has a different worldview, has to be able to explain it. Whereas, if you come from the mainstream worldview, you don't ever have to explain it. It's just assumed that everyone else should adapt to yours rather than you explaining what it is. Um, but I guess we all know that we're not all the same, right? And um, we don't share the same beliefs about knowledge or how we gain knowledge. So th that's why these questions are kind of um, they're interesting questions, but they also reveal a lot. Okay, um, so yeah, hopefully you did come up to understand this a little bit. So how, what you believe about your philosophy and what you believe about the world is going to impact on how you do research. Okay, uh, now that was pretty blah, 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 blah for me. Um, ask questions whenever you want. The only thing is, uh, Kyle's going to run around with the microphone. So if you have questions or whatever, just interrupt me any old time. Otherwise, I'll talk for like four hours uh, and it'll be really boring, especially for everyone online. So if you have questions, just go ahead and fire away. Um, but I'll keep going. So just, yeah, just flag down Kyle if you have a question and he'll bring you a microphone. Um, so I guess now there's been a couple of different versions of this iceberg model of culture, and I think it was Spindler that first came up with it, but there's been a couple of more modern versions. Um, but basically, I hope you can all understand this. It's like when you see an iceberg, I think everyone recognizes, right, that when you see an iceberg, there's only like 
a little chunk of it that's visible above the surface. So and I think when we, we need to start thinking about culture this way as well. So there's the, the visible parts of culture, but then there's the underlying philosophy is really what holds philo like philosophy, like values and beliefs. Those are what hold up. That's the bulk of the culture that holds the visible part up. Um, so I don't know. Do I need to explain this or not? Is everyone kind of familiar with this distinction between visible culture and underlying philosophy values? Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of like the visible parts of our culture are things like their action things, like their, uh, like how we dress, the buildings that we're in, um, our song and dances, things that we eat. So it's kind of like the ways we do things mostly. Um, Whereas the underlying stuff is the way we think. And our, that's our, like our way of being, rather than not just necessarily demonstrated in, in our, uh, what we're doing. Um, okay, so I think everyone here is kind of clear on that one, but if anyone online has questions about that, we can go back to it later. Um, but to me, that's important because it's like, so I can live in the city and still be indigenous, or but it's just like just if I like Chinese food doesn't make me Chinese, you know, or listening to hip hop music doesn't make me African American. Um, it's the beliefs that I have and the values that I hold, the philosophy that I hold that makes me indigenous, and that's what makes me who I am. So I don't have to go around wearing buckskins and feathers in my hair uh, to prove that I'm indigenous. That's something that's inside of me. Um, so there are visible displays of culture, but to me, much more important is starting to think about who am I inside, um, okay? So I hope that makes sense for y'all. And I'm not seeing anyone objecting or anything so far, so I'll assume you're all, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Someone didn't have a question there, so we'll pause for a second. Well, the microphone is making its way around. Okay. Turned on. I don't know if it's turned, is it turned on. Turned on. I think. Yeah, it is. Yep. So people, a lot of people say, well, one thing you need to do is make sure the signs are all written in the language of the of the area, and that you plant plants that are indigenous in the area. Uh, not realizing that that's the top part. That's just, the, it's so easy to do that. Uh, all of you can do that. Yep. But doing the underneath part is the hard part. Yeah, so yeah. when people say, you know, that we're here to kind of decolonize the curriculum or to indigenize the campus, sure, we, we can all do things like that. We can plant the right kind of plants. We can change all the signs so they're written in the language from here. But that's not indigenizing it. It's, just, it's, it's putting some window dressing on, but it's not really mm. going any deeper than that. Yeah. 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 So, so if you expect that after we leave, all the plants are going to change around here and all the signs are going to be written <laughs> in the language from here, that's, that's not what we're here to do. Uh, and suddenly, suddenly Hatley Castle is going to look like a longhouse. And, yeah. And, yeah. And it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> And, I, and, and that's important to realize, too, because if you, if you look back at, like, um, you're going to back up here. Yep. I was thinking, so if you have a strong understanding of the bottom part of that iceberg, uh, that is the core of what it is to be indigenous or whatever culture you identify. It's the stuff underneath. Because if you think about, you know, how, is that, how will that iceberg change? as it enters a different environment. So what would happen if that iceberg rolled? So you have, you'd be showing a different part of your culture, right? Um, so how many of you have like traveled to a different country? And it was like, when you go to a different country, sometimes you wear different, or you're on holidays, so for example, so you're not wearing your business clothes that you wear to work, but you're hanging around in your bathing suit and uh, you're drinking pina coladas by a pool. So you've totally changed your visible culture but does it change who you are? So it doesn't really, right? So we have to recognize that sometimes our culture shifts um, depending on what situations we're in, but it also is heavily impacted by outside influences, right? So if there's like a great big wave that comes over this, if you can imagine that 
suspected that is actually a South Pole iceberg and there's like penguins on it and whatever, a big wave washes over, it's gonna change the, the demographics of the iceberg. Um, so that's what happens with a lot of different cultures that they get impacted by outside influences. And yeah, the visible parts really change and they adapt to something new, but hopefully they maintain what they are underneath. Um, well, th that's what we want anyway. Uh, and I think that that's what most indigenous people want is to people to recognize, yeah, yeah, we're living in the modern world. And when we're talking about decolonization, we're not talking about putting everyone back in sailboats and sending them back to Europe or wherever. It's about you know, let, allowing us to live our culture and allowing us to, to carry on our ways of thinking and our values. Um, anyway, so if you start to think about research, so that using that iceberg model as a model of culture, it's also, that's how research works, okay? So if you think about um, when you start to learn research methodologies and research methods and stuff, really the methods that you're learning are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so it's the stuff that's underneath. So those, it's, that's what makes your research unique to your culture and to your belief systems, all right? So, and that's really what your research paradigm is, is the stuff that's underneath the water. So that's things like your understanding of the very fundamental basis of reality. So what, your ontology, like what is real, okay? It's about your ways of knowing. So how do we know something's real? Like how, do, how does knowledge work in our understanding? So that's your, your epistemology. It's also your axiology, which is your things like your values. So what is actually worth researching? What is okay to do in order to, to gain knowledge? Um, who owns that knowledge once you start to look at it or explore it? <laughs> All right. But it's also your methodology. Like your, that's looking at your strategies that you might use as you start acquiring knowledge. So. Of course, those are tied to your, your methodologies t should be at least tied to your methods, but they are fundamentally different things in that the methods are the specifics, that's like the, the visible parts of what you do, the methodology is the underlying philosophy behind it. Um, but, and this is the same for, I mean, this is not indigenous research, this is all research. <laughs> okay, so does anyone have any questions or comments so far? E hold on, will the microphone's making its way over there. Kyle's getting to work out. Hi, not really a question, but I, I'm just thinking that, and I know these in PowerPoints, we often do short versions of what we're trying to say, but when I was thinking about what you've written, and I think of research not as acquiring knowledge, but sort of co-developing knowledge, because <laughs> yep. there's an orientation to acquiring knowledge, certainly in yeah. all contexts, definitely working yep. with other cultures and such, you know, that sort of extractive view of research. So it's, it's very difficult with language to find the language that's going to really truly express the complexity of how you orient to research. So anyway, yeah. I just was, yeah. I was just, I was like, I don't think I actually acquire knowledge. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's what we're going to talk about too. But it's, yeah, I think you, you enter into a relationship with knowledge, right? So you're not acquiring, and that's why I don't like, oh, let's explore this idea. And it's like, eh. that sort of, um, Kasia Henneke at uh, UBC talks about like when the, the um, British first came to Australia, they declared the land terra nullius. So it's like land that belongs to no one. Um, and that's sort of how they justified their colonization of Australia is saying, well, the people that aren't here aren't actually people, that's just part of the local flora and fauna. So this is nobody's land, so it's fine for us to take it. Um, but he s extends that concept and says, well, that's also how the colonial system views knowledge. So it's called niche nullius. It's like, this knowledge is, doesn't belong to anyone, so anyone can go and take it and own it. Um, and it's a, a very similar concept, yeah. So that's why I don't like exploring ideas. <laughs> to me, it carries too much uh, baggage, that word. Yeah. But, yeah, but, but yeah, that's mostly what we're going to talk about the rest of the time. Hopefully, but maybe not. <laughs> uh, it, it, and yeah, if anyone wants to just explore any of these ideas further, that's kind of... 
Um, so I guess, so I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, indigenous research methodologies from now on. So right now, that sort of back goes like some set in some of the context for what I'm going to talk about from now. Um, but just understanding that your research methodology is a reflection of your worldview, it's a reflection of your underlying philosophy. Um, so the stuff I'm going to talk about now is kind of um, comes from research that I've done, but also a lot of working with different elders. So the, some of the elders that I just wanted to sp specifically mention are Lionel and Jermaine Kanua, who uh, are Lakota elders that have worked with quite a bit. Uh, Don Cardinal, who's um, Cree from, he's not from Saddle Lake, where is he from? Onion Lake. Um, so Don's already passed. Uh, Floyd and Phelan Sutherland, who from Pegwis Reserve. May Louise Campbell, who's Métis Elder, Emil Wolfgram, who is, uh, I would say, Pacifica Elder. He's Tongan, grew up in New Zealand, but lives in Hawaii, so <laughs> a Pacifica Elder. Uh, Jerry Saddleback, who's Cree uh, from Hobima, and also my parents, Stan and Piggy Wilson. So those are some of the main elders that I've worked with, um, along with elders I'm working with now are more and more in Australia. but. Um, this is sort of a retrospective thing. Uh, the, the prospective things will talk about those elders a bit differently. Um, and I think that for me, um, there's a real sort of imperative at the moment to start using a bit more indigenous research paradigms and indigenous research because I think that the situation and the state that our world is in right now uh, requires a different way of looking at things um, because basically we're fucking up the planet and if we want to change things we have to change the way we do research, we have to change the way we think about things. My mom's getting mad at me because I'm swearing. <laughs> she doesn't like it when I swear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, uh, uh, so Jack Forbes, I can't remember when the original version of this book came out, but this, he wrote the second edition of Columbus and Other Cannibals when George Bush came into power. Uh, George Bush came into power. George Bush, the second version, <laughs> um, thinking, "Oh my God! Oh, could anything get any worse?" <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so. I think that th this concept of Buitigo disease is really interesting. And if we start to view colonialism as a disease, um, and that disease might be called egophrenic psychosis or malignant egophrenia. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about this. So uh, a, a quote from Jack is that, you know, Buitigo disease is, um, or his description of it is that greed knows no limits. Perversion knows no borders. Arrogance knows no frontiers. And deceit knows no edges. So those are symptoms of Wheatigo disease. Um, so I've been talking with different indigenous people about this concept of Wheatigo disease. Um, so... I was talking with my dad about it, and, and so he was sort of describing it as a mental, social, emotional sort of, sp but especially a spiritual crash, um, where people be. I guess the easiest way to describe it is if you view reality as relational, you step outside of those relationships. Okay. Now, when I've talked with uh, elders in Australia about this, um, they were saying, oh, that's similar to our concept of a yaoi. Now, there's different things called yaois in Australia, but there's one that's kind of more like thought of as kind of like the, more like a Sasquatch, which is kind of just another primate, so it's not really the same thing. But there's like a big difference between a Sasquatch and a yaoi. I mean, a, a Sasquatch and a Wheatigo. A Sasquatch is just another primate, whereas a Wheatigo is a human that has turned bad. And through 
usually through the consumption of human flesh, they become a cannibal and that totally changes their fundamental nature of who they are. Okay, um, and I think the la... Oh, anyway. I'll switch, put that aside for now. <laughs> I can talk about that for later. But, okay, so when we started talking, I started talking with different people in Australia about the, their concept of a yaoi. Um, and it is very similar to our concept of what a Weetigo is. And it's one thing that um, talking with a Yuan elder was that the yaoi, or the yaoi has no reflection. So it can't see itself in, if it looks in a lake or a mirror or whatever. It's kind of like a vampire, right? It doesn't have a reflection. But also it, it's characterized because it just wanders around aimlessly. Okay? Um, a Wiradjuri view of it was that it's, it's someone that has no skin. It's not as in skin, but skin being your relationships with other people. So it has no skin, it has no relationship, it has no, no kinship. It doesn't belong in any kinship system. So therefore it also doesn't have any relational accountability. Okay. Um, and I also started to talk about, ooh, well how do you fight against... Uh, oh, and also... <laughs> what I thought was really funny was it's described as a big orange hairy man. Um, so you can draw your own analogies there, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's just weird. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was starting to think. Well, yeah. So we've got we to go disease. We recognize that having a malignant egophrenic psychosis is having your a malignant ego is damaging to the environment right so the one of the biggest sins you can commit as a creep person is being greedy um, and this is what we to go is you, you through the consumption of human flesh you always want more so that's a, a symptom uh, symptomatic of we to go disease is you keep eating and eating and the more you eat the more hungry you become so it's it's like a description of capitalism, really. Um, okay, so I was starting to talk about people, but well, yeah, okay, well, this we we can recognize this. What do we do about it? Um, so, um, you know, I was talking with my dad about it, and he said, well, one of the things that you can do to overcome Weetigo disease is it's asked, it can be overcome by pure willpower. So it's Using your um, using your mind uh, to overcome fear and have belief that the spirits will take care of you. So it's not necessarily curing a wee to go, but it is protecting yourself from a wee to go. Um, in the old days, how wee to goes used to be taken care of was they were strangled um, because it was recognized that they were the biggest threat to the ongoing sustainability of communities. So I think Jack Fiddler was the last person in Canada that was convicted of uh, and sentenced to hang back in 1908, I think, for uh, being a shaman that killed Weetigos. That was his job as a, a medicine person. Um, he was Ojikri from near the Manitoba, Saskatchewan border. Um, so this was something that we took very seriously and it was one of the few things that carried sort of capital punishment was being greedy, um, basically. Um, so anyway, so what I was thinking about, well, yeah, we're not going to go and, uh, you know, well, we all know what would happen if we tried that these days, uh, especially with a certain person who's in power. Um, so what are some other ways we can overcome or protect ourselves against we to go disease? Um, and you know, the, the Ewan guy that was saying about, the, you know, part of that thing about no reflection that wanders around aimlessly is one way to, to scare a Weetigo away is laughter. So if there is lots of laughter in your community, the Weetigos won't go there. Or, I mean, Yahweh's won't go there. Um, so I think it's important for us to continually mock and continue to laugh at certain people. <laughs> uh, but also another person was describing it as, you know, sometimes you have to recognize that it has more power than you sometimes. 
So it can be stronger than you and it will kill you if you get close enough and it will eat you. So sometimes you just need to stay undercover and hide. So I think that it, as we go about doing this, you know, you've got to learn to choose your battles and sometimes you're going to get eaten up by this battle. So yeah, you duck and cover. Um, okay, so I think that this is, to me, that this sort of we to go disease is, is symptomatic of rampant camp capitalism and this sort of constant growth mentality that, you know, the more you eat, the more you need to eat. Uh, and that's what's ruining our environment at the moment. So I think it's really important to start thinking about how we can change our society so that we're not all consumed by we to go disease. Um, and I think that indigenous research carries some answers for doing that. Um, you know, as I said, so there's, we can laugh at things and we can recognize that we have to hide. So I guess the rest of the time I want to talk a bit more about building indigenous knowledge, because to me this is one, one cure for we to go diseases, recognizing more traditional knowledge systems. Um, so I may pause for a minute and if anyone has any questions or comments or and Kyle's going to have to go for a run again. Rum. I wonder if you can speak a little bit more to uh, the spiritual crash. I was interested that your dad used that term and just what that means, because I think there's a lot of confusion in mm. Canadian culture right now about the difference between religion oh, yeah. and spirituality. <laughs> yeah. And there's yeah. a resistance to spirituality coming into educational systems because of that confusion. Mm. Can yeah. you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, okay, yeah, I think that, like, if we start to think about a spiritual crash, it is, like, going back to that concept of no skin, so that you don't, you're not in relationship with people, so it's also, like, not recognizing that, like we were talking about this the other day with the Heron Elders group, I don't like called it, the Heron group, <laughs> don't like being called elders, and that's, that's reasonable, and I need to train myself to stop saying that, um, the Heron group, that there is, it's problematic that Western society doesn't see things as having spirit. So not talking about, yet even about spirituality, but just talking about spirit and what is spirit and that everything has spirit. So I think most people recognize, yeah, humans have spirit and human has, therefore they have agency, therefore they have sentience. So sentience and, and spirit and agency are all assumed to be the same thing. So anything then that doesn't show sentience isn't, doesn't have a soul and doesn't have a spirit, right? Um, but part of that spiritual crash is not understanding that everything has spirit. So the land has a spirit. Knowledge itself has spirit. The animals have spirit. The trees, the grass, the, the rain that's falling, it all has spirit. So spirituality is, is really just understanding that. So it is a way of being in the world that recognizes the spirit. Well, that's my view of spirituality. <laughs> that's maybe not be yours. But my view of spirituality is it's that recognition that everything else in the world has spirit. And, and, and I base my actions upon that. I think that's like a personal belief versus religion, I think, is my external manifestation of that. So it's, it's almost like that cultural iceberg thing again. It's like spirituality is the core of the iceberg or the underwater part. Religion makes kind of like the top part is what you visibly show. But sometimes it doesn't even match, <laughs> right? So, you know, a lot of religions kind of become disconnected from their spiritual base. But I think most religions are at their core, awfully similar in that they are, the, are built around that recognition that we're all related and, you know, love each other and, you know, they have similar uh, underlying values, even though the demonstration of those values is done a different way. So I think that religion is sort of the external part of it, but because it's external, it also has then the possibility to become dogmatized. And I think that's when the religion can come separate from the spirituality part when the dogma 
becomes disconnected from the beliefs behind why you have those rules. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of all leading towards a spiritual crash is that disconnect, right? So you're not recognizing that spirit behind everything and you separate yourself from everything else. So therefore, it's okay to treat other things really badly because if they don't have a spirit, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You re lose track of that relational accountability. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're turned on. Yes, that's on. <laughs> um, so, Sean, I'm just um, just thinking about where to go and uh, this notion of our human condition in Western culture of not enough. You know, this what I see in psychotherapy is this never enough, not good enough, not a good enough boy or girl, not love, lovable enough. Mm -hmm. So this uh, a whole culture that conspires to tell you you're not enough is also, you know, kind of this recipe for um, keeping that colonial mindset, that take, take, take mindset alive. And I find the antidote, in my experience, is an alive, animated world relationship mm -hmm. where there is a real sense of homecoming and enoughness uh, within uh, our human souls, within ourselves in that relationship that yeah. doesn't need feeding in that same way. Uh, you know, it, it actually can't be fed from an external source as much as it's more um, kind of something energetic, or you might say spirit, I might say soul. You know, it's the, it's the something on the ground that almost is ineffable and can't be spoken of. Yeah, um, yeah. So also, I just wanted to say something about two words you were saying. Well, laughter. I read this amazing <laughs> quote the other day that said, laughter is carbonated holiness. <laughs> That's, it. That's Annie Lamont. And then also I was thinking of the word philosophy, which uh, taken apart means philo, to love, the love of uh, wisdom, you know, right. Sophia. So the love of wisdom is really uh, the cultural aspect that's invisible. The mm -hmm. love of our wisdom, of our culture, of our sharing, of our ancestral history. So it's another way to kind of reframe that than just the philosophy department at <laughs> Royal Roads. The love of wisdom department. Right? That sounds the, cool, yeah. Yeah, love, a real um, yeah. attunement to wisdom. Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't need to add anything to that. To, <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, so, um, okay. What was I going to talk about? So, so now again, yeah, starting to sh shift more into like a indigenous ways of doing things. Um, so to me, when, when we start to talk about different knowledge systems, and so I want to start talking about an indigenous knowledge system. Um, and to me, it is important that uh, we are using indigenous research to build our knowledge systems as indigenous people, okay? So it operates within an indigenous paradigm. Um, so I will talk about a little bit about what those things mean. Um, and to me, you can't do, oh, actually I should talk about the difference between indigenous and indigenous, okay? So I'm specifically using the word term indigenous here to name a philosophy or a philosophical system. Um, a love of wisdom system. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, it, so just, it's sort of naming a theoretical framework and naming a philosophy, just like it's, but it is shared by a lot of indigenous people, but it's not only for indigenous people, okay? So it's, I, like I also fem, uh, sort of identify as a feminist. So I don't have to be female to be a feminist. I don't think you need to be indigenous to be follow an indigenous research paradigm, all right? But at the same time, as a feminist, I recognize that there is no possible way I can have the lived experience of what it means to be a woman in this world and how that's going to impact on everything that happens around you. But I still believe in the, the, the philosophy behind it. So it, 
also comes, it's like, well, as an indigenous, yeah, you can believe in the philosophy, but doesn't mean you're going to have the same experience of the world as an indigenous person. But it's just sort of recognizing that, that, that yes, this is the philosophical system I want to follow. But then it also carries with it certain rules and responsibilities. That you then, if, if you choose to follow this system, these are the rules you have to live by. Okay, so anyway, so that's what we're talking about now. Um, I hope that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. No. Maybe. Hopefully, a little bit. Sometimes. <laughs> so that's my parents with all of their grandkids. Uh, so these are two really important concepts for indig understanding indigenous research paradigm. I should have changed the word there. It's an old slide. Um, so relationships and relationality are our way of viewing reality. So our reality is relational. And I'll talk about more about what that means in a minute. Because we live in a reality or have an ontology that is relational, that carries with it certain ways of requirements of behavior that are what we call relational accountability. So if you recognize that everything around you is in relationship and you are part of those relationships, you also are accountable to those relationships. Okay, so I want to just sort of pause for a second and do like a little of sort of like a visioning exercise. Um, so if you could all just close your eyes for a second. And while you keep your eyes closed, those of you who are online, just stare at your black screen. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you sort of a little bit about where this vision came from, but also get you to do a bit of visioning of your own. So I can't even remember what year it was, but back when I was working on my PhD, my brother and I were guiding, or were driving through the United States as he was doing his master's degree at the University of Sacramento, Sac State. Uh, we were driving along in his Jeep, so I'm just blathering for a while here so that your eyes stay closed and hopefully all the little floaters start to disappear and all turns black. Um, we stopped at Bear Butte, which is a sacred space for a lot of indigenous North American people, uh, as we we're going along the way. And part of the reason we stopped, we were thinking of stopping there anyway, but as we were driving along, my brother's Jeep kept stalling and not working. so. That was the closest place, so we, it was like it was guiding us to stop there. So we stopped there and spent the night. As we, so we parked in the parking lot there and we had our sleeping bags with us. So we took our sleeping bags up and slept on the neck of the bear. So if you imagine Bear Butte, it's kind of like two sort of humps. There's a big hump and there's a little hump that's his head. It's right next to the big one. So we stepped in the little crook between those two. Um, so through the night as it started getting darker and the mosquitoes started coming out, we said a little prayer and offered some tobacco and then the mosquitoes thankfully left us alone. As I was in that luminal space halfway between being asleep and being awake, I had this vision of me being like a little single point of light. And between me and the rock wall that sort of was the head of the bear on Bear Butte, which was maybe only 10 or 20 meters away, there were thousands of other little points of light all around, all around us, and all between me and that wall. Um, so that sort of that image and that vision sort of stayed with me. And we got up in the morning and went and did ceremony on, on the back, of, up, up at the top of Bear Butte. And when we came down and talked with some other people that were doing ceremony and having sweat lodge down in the ceremonial ground at the base of Bear Butte, one of the elders that was there said through the night he was looking up at the Bear Butte and there was streams of light coming down from the place where we were sleeping. So I don't know if how those are related, but it, they are all related. So I want to do a guided image of you. Now, hopefully you've kept your eyes closed long enough. It's nice and black in there. 
I want you to imagine now just a single point of light, a tiny pinprick of light, but really bright, but incredibly tiny also, shining in the middle of all the blackness. Now, because there's not really any sort of space and, or concept of how distance in this blackness of your eyes at the moment, imagine another little pinprick of light lights up. So there's two little pinpricks of light and an incredibly tiny little thread sort of a little filament sort of takes shape to join those two pinpricks of light. Now I want you to imagine a third pinprick of light now lights up. And as it lights up, put another tiny little filament going to the original two pinpricks. So now you've got like a little triangle, three dots of bright light with little filaments going between them. Now imagine a fourth pin prick of light and it sends out filaments to all the other three and then a fifth pin prick and it sends out filaments to the other four and the sixth and the seventh so and I want you to start just adding pin pricks of light and every time a pin prick of light shows up send it sends out filaments to all the other pin pricks of light so now you're on maybe 10. Now maybe see if you could add five pinpricks all at once. So it's choom, and it sends out filaments to all the others, and then add another 10, and another 20. So it's like starting to go faster and faster. You just keep adding more and more pinpricks as your mind is able to absorb them, and just keep sending out more and more filaments and more and more filaments so that all these pinpricks of light are all there. Now it should be sort of filling up your whole field of vision is now full of pinpricks of light and bazillions of little filaments all joining them together. Now, I want you to slowly open your eyes and imagine that that is the reality that we are in, is that everything you see around you is a little tiny pinprick of light, but what we are actually seeing is all the filaments. So it's like the filaments that have, are joining them together are so thick now that they become our physical world. Okay, now, so hopefully you can look around and see all these little, everything that you see is a little pinprick of light, and there's like a bazillion things, and that's what makes the floor, is those little filaments. That what's, that's what makes the desk, that's what makes my hand, is all the connections between all those little cells that are inside there. All right, so it, I, I guess you could sort of say like, a, it's kind of like chemistry, that's like, oh yeah, I know that, technically I know that I'm made up of a whole bunch of molecules, and actually, there's way more space between those molecules and those atoms than there is actually the, the physicality of what the, those are. That is, to me, a representation of what indigenous reality is. So reality isn't the individual atoms and the protons and neutrons and whatever that make up the atoms. Reality is the relationship between those atoms. So that's what makes a molecule. That's what makes a, a thing. That's what makes our reality is those relationships. And it's those relationships that form solidity and they form everything around us. So that is what is going to guide everything we talk about when we talk about doing research. That is the fundamental nature of our reality is that is relational. So the relationality is our reality. Everything is relationships. Without relationships, matter would cease to exist. Okay? Um, but it's, I don't know, does that, that's a hard one to get your brain around. So if you, you can understand that, then you know, everything else is easy. So. <laughs> Every, yeah, everything's a web, you know, it's all, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so it's those relationships that make us who we are, but it's also our, our roles in those relationships. That's our way of being in the world. So it's like we aren't individuals per se. We are roles. I am a father. I am an uncle. I am a grandfather. I am a 
great, 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 great grandson. I'm a great, 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 great grandfather. Like these relationships extend through time and space and that that's what makes me who I am. I'm not Sean, I am the sum of all those relationships, okay? Uh, so I think if you can start to understand that, and then everything else kind of makes a bit more sense. Then you can start to understand why Indigenous people do things the way they do, because everything is relational. Everything is those tiny little pinpricks of light, and if you think of all those pinpricks of light as spirit, everything has spirit. We are in relationship with all of those things, okay? Um, oh, I stopped, I forgot to keep explaining these little pictures. <laughs> so that's me back when I had long hair. <laughs> that's my boys <laughs> when they were little. And that is my grandmother. So my grandmother, like my dad's mother. And so you see my dad around. And so she is Chapan to those, my kids. And they are Chapan to her. So it's like great grandparent, great grandchild. Chapan is the name of that relationship. And that's my sister, Alex. And I was saying before, you can tell she's concentrating because she's got her tongue poking out. <laughs> it's fun to tease your siblings when they're not here to defend themselves. <laughs> so our ways of knowing and um, our ways of being in the world, basically everything is based on those relationships. So if you want to start to put philosophical names on it, it's like a relational epistemology. That's your way of thinking about things is your way of thinking. Oh yeah, everything's relational. So I think about relationships, okay? Uh, that picture is a picture of my dad when he was at the Indian Day School on our reserve. Uh, so can I point him out? Where is he? He's um, right there. That's him and that's his sister. Uh, and we're trying to figure out what year that was, and we came up with around 1945, I think is what we said, somewhere around there. So he would have about seven or eight. Yeah, so that's before he went to residential. So yeah, they had a, a day school, Indian day school on our reserve. So he went there for a, a few years. Actually, he must be older there because he didn't learn English until he started going to school. So he, and that was later on in life. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's probably, so probably when he's about seven years, so maybe eight, seven or eight, something like that. So that's when he's learned English. Um, anyway, so that's our, our ways of knowing are based on relational epistemology. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I'm, I kind of feel like I'm talking an awful lot. I'm about a quarter of the way. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Hold, hold on, hold on. Wait for the microphones. People online can hear. You know, what I'm reminded of, Sean, is, um, you know, there's so much forgetting. Uh, and I see so much loneliness. Like if the, if there's actually a ministry of loneliness now in the UK, and that would be the people that are identifying as lonely, like so oh, yeah. isolated and desperate that they're suicidal. The the forgetting of these connections is that that's that not belonging. That's that sense of not belonging anywhere. Hmm. And so it's the. You know, it's not only just sort of a, a lovely poetic thought to remember we're all connected in a webby entanglement. Entanglement. It's actually our survival of our species. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the way we relate to all the other species. This is at the core of our work in, you know, in environmental sustainability and whatever we want to call it, you know, relational, re relationability or, you know, our a deep kinship. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. and it's it's while it's been on an outlier kind of an edge, you know, it's not natural science. It's and I think, well, we, you know, we've just had half the equation. We've been so lopsided for so long, uh, just looking at things through one lens. So it's, mm. um, yeah. uh, you know, I think this is critical right now. Well, and, uh, yeah, and it's not just in uh, environmental sciences. I, I think really in, in psychology as well. And I think yeah, this exactly. is. A big symptom of modern society is that people feel that their self-worth 
is a self thing rather than collect oh i have to be my own individual rather than who am i in relationship so yeah i am an uncle i'm a son i'm a nephew i'm all of these things that's who i am i don't need to be sean because i am all those relationships so you get i think there's a lot of modern literature is really based around this concept of people going on a journey to find out who they are and it's like well that's not going to tell you who you are who you are is who your the relationships that you're in <laughs> but people don't sort of recognize that in this modern and those society. are mirrors too your family are your mirrors too yeah. you know for who you are <laughs> yeah yeah and that's that being able to remember yeah thanks yeah so you don't need to be an individual you are who you are in relationship. Okay, there was another th question. Hi, thank you. Thank you for putting up the picture of the day school too because it's something that reminds me that there have been things in place that have fractured those relationships. Oh yeah. Relationships to who you are as in your community, as a father, as a brother, as a son, all of those types of things as well as your relationship to your own body and and how how you know yourself and so i think that um when we think of the relationships and a relational accountability there a lot of that like and a lot of like the the colonial colonization and decolonization will be to like sort of renew who we are as people and and how we are in relationship with each other yeah. And I think that that is work in itself is to remember and repair those relationships. Yeah, yeah. And, and to me, that's when people talk about decolonizing your mind. That's like um, Michael, oh, what's Michael's last name? Uh, Redbird talks about, no, not Red. What's Michael's last name? Yellowbird. Yellowbird. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> decolonizing your mind. That's what he's talking about. It's like rebuilding those relationships. And I think that, you know, one thing that doesn't get, talked about, well, people talk about, you know, sort of the residential school system as a form of genocide or cultural genocide, but what it really also was, was a form of epistemicide, epistemicide. So it was a way of killing off an epistemology, killing off a way of thinking. So you, you were trying to get all those kids to assimilate into a Western understanding of the world by killing off their indigenous knowledge systems. Yeah. I have yep. the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Um, this has been really interesting for me. Um, I have a comment that inspired my question. Um, so as you were leading us through the activity of thinking about the sparks of light, as those lights were emerging from me, as you were leading us through it with your voice, my lights were building um, side by side. When we got to the third light, you forced me to change the way I was building my lights. And so I'm interested if anybody else was building their light in a different way. So by the third one, you said, uh -huh. you should now have a triangle of lights. And I didn't. I had lights. <laughs> Three in a row. <laughs> Three in a row. Oh. So that was, that was very interesting for me. And so yeah. one of the things that I started processing was um, when you talk about the relationships and all of the very many different components of it, I identify as a person who has a very, very complex um, has very complex elements because I'm an immigrant to Canada, because I grew up in the Caribbean, and when you put Columbus up there, I knew what you were talking about there. I know the story of that. And I'm also a student learning about indigenous ways of knowing and people and being and thinking and all of those pieces. So as I'm sitting in this, I'm thinking about what am I building and going to leave this space with when you're done? Because I think everybody's gonna leave with something different, right? Which is really interesting. And so my question to you is, what are you thinking you're going to leave this space with when you're done with sharing today? Okay, well, I, I don't know if, uh, you remember my dad was talking about the concept of, indigenous concept of, or a Cree concept of pedagogy isn't really pedagogy, it's not teaching, it's, a, uh, and I can't remember how to say it. Uh, no, but the Cree word, do you remember? 
Um, but means basically how we are all learning and teaching together, how we're all learning together. So even just as you said that, it made me realize, you know, I had never thought of that before that someone would. And then I thought, actually, in, 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 um, what's the name of that book? It's like, if you're trying to describe a three-dimensional space to a two-dimensional being, it doesn't, flatlanders, flatland, um, right? So if you're thinking of a line, you, yeah, you will just keep adding points along a line. And then if you start thinking of a triangle, you would still just think of it as a triangle, right? And I was automatically thinking in my brain uh, in four dimensions because it's not like you're, you're making these points of light in three dimensions, but also thinking, oh yeah, historical points of light, future points of light, and, that, and those are part of our relationships too, right? And we all recognize that, like we all recognize, yeah, we have relationships with our great grandparents who have passed away because we remember them, so they're part of a relationship. So we recognize that somehow, but I need to be a bit more careful with how I start describing that. <laughs> but that's really cool, that's exciting to me that that you were able also to just make that and, and to come to that self-realization is really cool. Uh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing I'm learning that, amongst others. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, make one. So relational, where, am I, where was that? Uh, talked about that, talked about the... Uh, as we make all those relationships we were talking about, you, a big aspect of things is that once you make those relationships, you become accountable to them, all right? So that's our ways of being in the world. So our ways of being are reciprocal. That's respectful and, and you are responsible. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, well, oh, this is me making, um, oh, sorry, I'm switching on my screen, not yours. Let's be uh, cook, cooking a whole bunch of fish to feed people. <laughs> Back in the days when I was skinny and had hair. <laughs> well, I still have hair, but it was long. <laughs> this is uh, me standing up on Cape Byron, looking back at the beaches of Byron Bay. That's where our local beach, so that's where I get to hang out on the weekends. Um, so anyway, all of that kind of hopefully maybe we're able to take out of research as ceremony. This is a part I didn't actually talk about in research as ceremony is why research as ceremony. And I realized that afterwards, it's, oh, <laughs> that may have been actually kind of good to describe in there. <laughs> um, so that's what I want to talk about a little bit. And this will probably be stuff that's all in research is ceremony part two. So you're getting like a sneak peek. Okay, um, and how much, we've got about 45 minutes left, so I'll, I may have to go kind of fast through this, but that's all right. Um, still interrupt me whenever you want. All right, so there's the, first we have to start to think about things, uh, realize that reality is those relationships, right? The next most important thing to think about was shared by Emil Wolfgram, who is the, guy sitting there in the, you know, he would call it a wool cap, we call it a toque here in Canada, <laughs> um, so who is the Pacifica elder. So he is describing things as, um, we were talking about the, this the relational nature of reality, and he was describing that the space between things in a relationship is mana. So that's what the one understanding of what mana is. So the Pacifica concept of mana is sacred. Mana means sacred, but it also means it is the space between things, and that is sacred space. So anytime we do something to enter into that space between things, we are stepping into sacred space. Um, I hope that makes sense, because that sort of forms the basis for what comes next. So, you know, reality is relational. Where are those little pinpricks of light with the, the relationships between them? When we do something to enter into that or make those spaces closer, that is sacred space. Okay, so 
research a ceremony then? Well, how do you do a ceremony to deliberately enter into that sacred space? Because a lot of times you enter into sacred space accidentally. But again, that's not scientific research. Scientific research is when you have a system behind it. So how do you systematically or deliberately enter into that sacred space? Um, so I started to think about, well, it's ceremonies that bridge sacred space. So ceremonies help you to build closer relationships. So those are my parents getting married. So maybe you'll start to think of, we'll use the analogy. <laughs> we'll use the analogy of a marriage for a little while, about 10 seconds. <laughs> um, so I guess, and I, a lot of this stuff sort of comes around because of my, my taking place in a lot of different ceremonies. Um, and coming to realize that my role in sort of traditional ceremonies wasn't really any different than my role as a researcher. So uh, uh, for me, it was a personal journey also of understanding and bridging those concepts together, like as me, the different aspects of myself as a researcher and as a ceremonial person, right? Um, anyway, so a ceremony, you start to think about this as a ceremony is bridging in, going, deliberately going into that sacred space, okay? Uh, so if you think about, again, everything is those little points of light, right? Those points of light aren't all visible things. So those points of light are ideas sometimes, or they're abstractions. So they're, they can be physicalities, but they can also be abstractions. So how do you enter into a more sacred relationship and get closer to an idea? Okay, start to shift your thinking a little bit that way. Um, so I'm going to enter into a sacred relationship, build a, build a closer relationship with something, whatever my research topic is. So that's what we're doing when we do research. We're building a closer relationship with your research topic or an idea. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> yes, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> that would leave that with it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, the in-betweenness. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Definitely. Yeah. It's not just one thing. Yeah. It's a whole bunch of things. Yes. Well, and even recognizing that you know I am not just one little point of light. I'm every single molecule within me is a point of light too. It's anyway. So. Here's how you go about doing that then. So what are some stages in a ceremony? So this could be start to think about what's my research design. All right, so those, oh, oh, I forgot to talk about pictures as well. Parents getting married, oldest son Julius, I think that's him on back, upside down, Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> uh, these are stone circles in uh, Southern Norway. They're about somewhere around two and a half, three thousand 3,000 years old. But those, like, I mean, we can't be sure, but my interpretation of those circles, because I was also there with a person who is a history of religion person, <laughs> so we're helping to interpret what these were for, is likely it was for gathering of clans. So this was like a couple thousand years still before the Viking era, but back in the Bronze Age. Um, okay, so these are stages of the ceremony. So how do you go about doing it? First, you live a congruent lifestyle, okay? Now this is important, right? And no, no one ever thinks about this when they're doing research. You gotta live, or, live it first. So, but you think about it, well, if I'm entering into, say, like a marriage ceremony, live a congruent lifestyle first. So, if you're entering into a monogamous relationship, don't go and sleep with half the town beforehand, <laughs> right? <laughs> Start to live your monogamous relationship right off the bat. So you have to be living it before you start. All right, so if you're gonna do health research, you should be trying to live a healthy lifestyle yourself. If you're doing environmental research, you'd be trying to live in harmony with the environment before you even start. So it's, or 
if you recognize, oh shit, my relationship with the environment is pretty crappy right now, I'm going to start changing it now while I'm going to start this research. So you start to make the changes right away, all right? Live a congruent lifestyle. That's the first step in your research process. Uh, next thing you got to do is prepare the space. So with any ceremony, a lot of work goes into getting things ready. So um, whether it's gathering wood, whether it's making the food ahead of time, whether it's building a church that you can pray in, whether it is, whatever it is, a whole lot of work goes into preparing the space for people to hold rituals in, okay? So it's just being a little systematic and thinking about, well, what do we need in this space in order to get ready to hold our ritual? Um, so this is, this is like the planning and the setting up, okay? So part of it is like doing your ethics application. Part of it's doing your, making sure your voice recorder has batteries in it <laughs> if you're going to be interviewing people. So it's it, that sort of stuff. You have to prepare the space in which your ritual is going to take place. Okay. And th there's a whole bunch of ideas here. And, you know, most Western concepts also fit into here as well, but we're doing it in a di little different way. So then you, you bring everyone together. Sometimes all those people will help you prepare the space. Sometimes you do it yourself. Um, but you get together all the ingredients you need for holding your ceremony. Whether that's rocks and firewood and people that are going to go into a sweat with you. But you get all those actors together. And remember, when we're talking about actors, we're not just talking about human actors. We're talking about the more than human as well. So you bring everyone together, deliberately. So you bring them together. We're all coming together to talk about this. So you bring them together with intention. Okay. Um, and that's well. I mean, that's the same with you know you you know you're getting people to sign their information and consent sheets, and then you're all right. Let's meet at such and such place to talk about this. Then you engage in a ritual. So, what that ritual is, is going to be different for every type of research. Because I'm not talking here about research methods, I'm talking about a methodology or a strategy of inquiry, right? So, you have to adapt what the ritual is to your specific research topic. But, uh, Jerry Saddleback, who's a Cree elder uh, from Hobima, was said to uh, a bunch of us once that, as we were engaged in a, a ritual, he said, if the reason that you do things within ceremony in a ritualized manner. So like say if you think of a sweat lodge as a ceremony, there's all the stuff that goes place beforehand, getting all the rocks, building this, this, the lodge, getting all the ingredients, getting the food ready, right? You gather all the ingredients, you light the fire, blah, 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 blah. The actual ritual part is only a small component of what you do and then lots afterwards, right? When you're in that, the heart of the ceremony, if you call it that, you do things often in a ritualized manner. And you see this very much, say, like in the Catholic Church or any church that you go to, there is ritual involved. His description of the reason why you do rituals, so you do things in a manner that you repeat. So people know what's going to come next. People know what you're at this part of the ritual, and now this is going to come next. Um, he said you do that in a ritual manner because if you can get everyone that's in this space thinking about the exact same thing at the exact same time, and then a miracle will happen. So that is what we're doing when we do research. Getting everyone in the exact same think space, thinking about the same thing at the same time. Then a miracle happens. Okay? And the miracle we're looking for, usually, is enlightenment. And those of you that are teachers know it is a miracle when you can <laughs> teach someone anything. <laughs> if, you know, if it all works, suddenly your students understand something. It's like, oh, oh, I understand that. Okay, that's enlightenment. That is the modern everyday miracle that we're after when we're doing research. It's, oh, now I understand how that works. Oh, I understand that relationship a little bit better. That's a miracle. And it's not, so we're not talking about big earth-shattering, you know, 
go and write a, the Quran, rewrite the Quran miracle. We're talking about little miracles that happen every day. But increase the, its enlightenment. Okay? But that's not the end. So you get enlightenment. Then what? Then, again, you have to incorporate it into your lifestyle. So, um, it's like if you go back to the, to the marriage ceremony thing, there's no point in getting married if you're supposed to be going into a monogamous relationship. You slept, or you slept with half the town beforehand, so oh, I'm married, married now, I may as well go sleep with the other half of the town. No, it's you incorporate that new knowledge that comes from that ceremony into the, the way you live now. So you've learned something about health from your health research. You incorporate that into your own lifestyle, but you're also incorporating and helping other people to incorporate it. And to me, that's where wisdom comes from, all right? So it's, yes, I have understanding, I've gained much knowledge, but who cares if we can't use it somehow? Okay, so it, this is the use but also us as researchers, not just expecting other people to use that information or that knowledge, but using it ourselves. So if your researcher does, if your research doesn't change you, doesn't change you as a person, doesn't change how you do things, then you haven't done it right. So if you have gained new understanding, but it doesn't make a difference in your life, then it's not worth anything. So that's part of the axiology of this all. Okay? Now, that's kind of the main thing I wanted to get to. So I've got a bunch of other stuff I could talk about. But um, does anyone have any questions for now? Okay. <laughs> okay. Of course. Here has a question. <laughs> so do you know our motto is called live is living our learning? Yes. That is our motto, actually. It's life changing. I think sometimes oh, it can be it ironic, but I think that's <laughs> it. Um, when you say if you don't if you're not changed by your research, then you know you haven't done it right. So that would also kind of intimate that it's research. It's like a a researching of self, no matter if it's mathematics or science or poetry or environmental studies or education, it's this researching. It's something that that matters greatly to the the one who's researching, yeah, as well yeah. as to the benefits that you yeah. know. We we often don't we don't look at that. Mm -hmm. We say, what benefits are this? Well, to society, and we'll disseminate our findings, and you know. And, or I'll get my degree, but what will change for you in terms of, you know, yeah, your, your uh, the own way behavior. you live and the yeah. way you are and the way you will, will be? I mean, I, I love that. So thank mm. you for that. I just want to say thank you. you mm, pass this on, but I'm okay. missing talking to in, you know, I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> less rarely than Hillary, or more rarely. Uh, so thanks, Sean. This has been really interesting for me. But can you talk a little bit more about, you talked about science as a system of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed this, your, your explanations of the relational nature of, of, in, in the thinking. But what would you say are the, the limits of indige an, an indigenous research approach? And to elaborate a little bit, I mean, the the brilliance of the, the reductionist Western scientific method <laughs> is that you could know particular parts of a system extremely well, yeah. but it misses some of the interactions and the complexity. Then we have ecology that helped us understand relationships and complexity theory that helps yep. deal with some of the em emergent properties. So what would you say are the, uh, are the limits of this approach? And more importantly, yeah. how yeah. can you link it and, and in integrate it with other, with other ways of doing it. Well, I, to me, it, it links and integrates really well with physics. Uh, so that's why I always say it's like, it doesn't mean it's qualitative. It's just an approach, you know, and you can describe yourself in, if you want numbers or language, music, poetry, whatever. Uh, but I think when, you know, when you start to talk about complexity theory, it, it, I think it really links really well with complexity theory, and especially when you start to think about entanglement. So how, How, 
uh, is it Karen Barad? Uh, I can't remember if she talks about complexity theory or about entanglement. But the uh, modern physicist Karen Barad is talking about how, you know, when you start to think about uh, entanglement and how, you know, when quantum particles are entangled. So it's something can, you change one thing in a quantum entanglement and it changes, automatically changes the other thing at the exact same time. Doesn't So that it's beyond goes beyond the speed of light. So it's like no one understands how that works. So those particles are quantumly entangled. You insert that into complexity theory and how everything is interrelated and it's like it's interrelated but there's also in quantum entanglement in amongst all those interrelationships. So everything is interrelated. Ugh. Everything is all changing. You change one thing over here and it's something else over here is going to change. Maybe maybe you know like a plus minus relationship or maybe they both change at the same time or whatever but it's that recognition of and things are entangled and they're incredibly complex. So I think it's more like an inductive approach to research that is looking at the relationships between things as more important than the reductionist little things themselves. So perhaps we may not get as close a view of the individual entities. Instead, you have a view of the relationship between them. So I think that's probably the limitation is that, yeah, you sacrifice some of the view of the bits instead of viewing the relationship. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, yeah, there's limitations to everything. Yeah. Um, but I think it's sort of, this is more like a grand unifying theory of physics. <laughs> I have some online questions. Okay. Um, Gwen online has asked, um, is there any particular research that you've done that has changed you, um, inquiry or broader? Oh yeah, but all my research changes me, I think, <laughs> and I, th I hope it makes me a better person though. That's, that's, that's my intention. I don't know why I'm looking at Kyle. It's <laughs> should be like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think all my research changes me and, and it's like, I hope that uh, it's hard to say this without sounding very egotistical, but I hope it's made me a better person and I hope it's made me happier because I think that, you know, I kind of would like to live, well, I mean, I do my best. I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but I'd like to live more along the lines of um, if I'm in a relationship, I want those to be good relationships. So I try to be the best I can be. And that, that, but part of that is also like recognizing that that laughter is the big, part of life and love is a big part of life. So try to be more loving and, and laugh more. Uh, so hopefully that's working, but <laughs> it's, that, that sounds really, really uh, egotistical somehow. I don't know. <laughs> Another online question? Yeah, there's one more question. Um, since collective meaning making is relational and ceremonial. Can you speak to the research as intellectual property norm in academic publishing? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. To me, that's part of that, also that, why I don't like the word exploring it. So it's almost like, oh yes, I'm Columbus. I'm here to take over this knowledge. Uh, knowledge is there, knowledge is relational. So it's like, I may be the first one to have written this stuff down, but it doesn't mean it's like my knowledge. Uh, so that's hard with, but, but at the same time, right? I also recognize that I benefit from it. So I benefit from having written down this knowledge. Like, you know, I, as an academic, you have to write it down. And that's part of, part of what your job is, is, and that's how you get recognized and promoted and tenure and all sort of crap is through writing this stuff down but it's an uneasy relationship. <laughs> so that maybe that's one relationship I could work on being a bit better at. Yeah, I don't like it very much. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm feeling very grateful to be here in this space and to be kind of sharing this, um, this conversation and being part of this ritual. Um, and so I wanted to, and this, to ask you to talk more, like whatever you want to say after this, I'm interested as well, but um, to talk more about being in relationship with ideas and about the idea of engaging in ritual to connect us in relationship to ideas. 
Why certainly, it's almost like a segue. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think that, when, like, I mean, that's what we do as academics, right? We're in relationship with ideas all the time. And that's part of our job as teachers is to sort of share the joy of that relationship with students. And it's not like saying, I own this knowledge. I'm transferring this knowledge, the, the property rights to this knowledge to you as a student. It's like, wow, isn't this fun? <laughs> and they will come in and say, oh, you know, this is kind of stupid. But <laughs> or sometimes they'll say, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. But I think they all more often say, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool when they see that you're passionate about it and they see that you have this relationship with ideas that is kind of fun. And it's like, hey, I want, I want, to, I want some of that too, rather than if you're kind of have a pretty boring relationship or uh, obligatory relationship with knowledge or ideas, then I think that comes across to students as well. It's like, they don't want to be here. <laughs> they don't really believe this thing that we're, they're talking about. Why should I believe it? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. But to me, it's also, I think maybe a distinction between data, knowledge, and wisdom. So, and it's like, I think oftentimes we confuse data for knowledge. Like little bits of information aren't really knowledge. They're little bits of information. It's how they tie together that makes it knowledge. But it's, knowledge is also not enough either. It's how we put that knowledge into action that, and learn from that action and change our relationship. That that's when it becomes wisdom. So I think to me, that's an important, like, I don't even know how to describe it, a continuum maybe between data and knowledge and wisdom. So I think it's wisdom when we have started to incorporate it into our lifestyles. Oh, sorry, these are just on autoplay, so they'll keep going. <laughs> well, oh, but then it ties up, like, yeah, how do we document it then? So you've got this new idea and you've, not a new idea, but you've come to this relationship with an idea that's brought you closer, so you've got a new understanding of something. What are you going to do with it, right? Part of what we do as academics is we document it, but usually in writing. But I mean, different peoples have had different ways of documentation. So maybe you document it by getting a tat. Uh, if your tattoos mean something, not if they're meaningless, but for different people, different cultures, tattoos are a way of saying, I have gained this level of knowledge about this thing. So therefore, I'm demonstrating it on my skin. So people that know how to read are literate in reading tattoos can read them just like we read these little squiggles on a piece of paper and understand them as words. People can read those. People, some people are trained in how to read artwork. So they can look at an artwork and say, oh, that's what that means because they've got the training. Um, but I have never had training in how to read tattoos. I've never had training in how to read artwork. So I don't know how to read it, but I recognize that other people can. Uh, and it doesn't make it, you know, some other people can read the environment really well, so they can go for a walk outdoors and tell you a whole bunch of stuff about the environment just from looking around. And it's like, I don't have that knowledge about how to read that. I haven't had that training. But <laughs> it, it also comes back to how do you relate those ideas to other people, right? So do you relate them through writing? Do you relate them orally? Do you relate them through a tattoo? It's part of that engagement with ideas is how you pass them on or... That's part of the relationship, I guess. It's like a, it's like a threesome you're having with, a, <laughs> with an idea and you're trying to pass it on to someone else. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> Did anyone else have comments or are there any more online? Uh, what else did I have in here? I can't remember. But th these are just kind of on autoplay. So I, um, oh yeah. And so when you're starting to apply this, you're applying indigenous knowledge. It doesn't matter where you are. If whether you're like you're on the subway in Hong Kong or you're lying in a canoe going down the Saskatchewan River. Again, it's not. The, I'm applying this in whatever setting I'm in. It's not like a. Um, 
I think I was talking about this the other day, right? So it's like I was, I remember being in Hong Kong and I was looking at these modern, what is the equivalent of a modern canyon, right? And seeing how the plants are interacting with the light coming through here. And it's like, so yeah, you can apply these knowledge systems. Just, you don't have to be out in, the, out in the wilderness to apply indigenous knowledge. You can be doing it anywhere. So it becomes part of how you engage with the world around you and what you start to see. So you start to see the relationships between things. So what's the relationship between those buses and the subways and the trams? And what's the relationship between the water and the rocks? What, and how is it talking to me? So it's like I was walking on Charlie's trail the other day and I was stopping to think about how I was relating with the environment and specifically starting to listen to what the environment was trying to tell me as I was walking through it, just using my ears, right? And it's like, oh yeah, I can hear how my footsteps sound differently as I walk on gravel versus hard things versus like those little bridges that are down there versus like when you're squelching through the mud or as you're walking off the trail and the leaves are brushing against you. It's constantly telling you different things through the way it's interacting with you, the, just the land. Um, and that's part of engaging in making a closer relationship with the land because I'm starting to listen to it. Um, yeah. I don't know, it, just stop with questions anytime you want. So it's starting to think about how we behave ourselves too, right? So how do I engage in respectful relationships is an important question. Because that you know, once you understand that reality is made up of relationships, so is knowledge is those relationships. That, well, how do I, how to behave in a respectful way? And that means sometimes how do I teach in a manner that's relational? But how do I behave in general towards knowledge? Recognizing that knowledge has a spirit as well. So am I treating the spirit of that knowledge respectfully? Hi, Sean. Uh, when, when, you, when you're talking about knowledge having a spirit, uh, sometimes what comes up, especially when, well, you know, in my own conversations with many people, but also in the classroom, when we're introducing some of your work and other Indigenous scholars' work, the question of appropriation comes up sometimes, often, I should say. Yeah. And it strikes me as I hear you speaking about the relationship, I can understand appropriation as a relationship as well, uh, but I'd, I'd just like to hear in your own words the, your, your perspective or any dilemmas or any thinking you've done about putting your, your work, your books and your writings out into the world and then how it gets, how those ideas get taken up by let's just say, for lack of a better word, non-Indigenous people. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, some of the ideas are important, of course, for everyone, but are there any concerns about appropriation? Yes and no. But see, if you'd been here on time... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, this is this I don't know part of this is this laughter thing it's like if you're hanging around with indigenous people you got to get used to getting teased a bit because it's like and I get teased a lot <laughs> and I deserve it a lot of the time <laughs> um, but I think that's why I started using the term indigenous instead of indigenous to describe this research paradigm because to me it's like I also describe myself as a feminist. It doesn't mean I'm female, and it doesn't mean I understand what it means to walk through the world as a woman and feel what that lived experience is like. But I identify with the philosophy and the beliefs behind it. So I think that people can follow an indigenous paradigm without claiming that they have the understanding of what it means, means to be indigenous. It just means that you're, this is the, philosophical belief system that I'm choosing to follow. Um, so therefore it's not, if <laughs> you can, I think, use the belief system without appropriating the lived experience. That may be the difference. But also there's like a relationship with ideas. It's like, 
are, you can also recognize that some people have a different relationship, say, with, uh, maybe easier to describe with the land. It's like the people that have lived in this land for tens of thousands of years have built a relationship that's an intergenerational ongoing relationship. If you think of it almost like akin to a marriage, it's not like they own the land, but they are in a, maybe like an exclusive relationship with it. And that doesn't mean I can't come along and be the f friends with the land, but I'm not claiming that I'm also married to it. So I don't know if that makes sense. It does make sense, and I apologize if I... <laughs> no, no, no. No, that's good, because it helps to reinforce things. Yeah. Um, there was a slide that you had uh, three or four ago that had a bunch of circles in relation to each other, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those. I don't know if I can, because I can't remember what you're... <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing. You, you, some relationships, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm breaking up with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, the, 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 I, I'm just, I, I was just trying to think also and demonstrate that, you know, that it's not just, like, I mean, most of the time I'm talking about theory and stuff, but the way that we view these things also impacts on how, uh, on our material culture, right, or, or the, the products that come out of our, our research. So I've got a paradigm that's, you know, there's those principles and stuff, those Beliefs about the, if you think about the paradigm as the beliefs about the world that we're in, right, that comes through or is put into practice via or uh, demonstrated through a set of principles. So these are, because I believe in this, I practice this, all right? So those, there's princ uh, principles that we have, and those are usually the basis of our protocols. Now, whether you're talking research protocols or protocols of how, how you behave in the classroom, there's certain protocols that we all follow, right? Because we all have expectations of how we're all going to behave in here. The same thing as you go to a church, there's protocols for how you behave there. Same as if you go to, like, a, a traditional Native American ceremony, there's protocols for how you behave. But there's also protocols for how we behave in everyday life. Hopefully, those protocols are a reflection of your principles your paradigm. It's still all kind of theoretical and how you put it into practice, right? But how you do all those things is going to impact on the products that you end up with. So what is the product of our research is usually, well, it depends what kind of research we're doing, right? It may be a paper, it may be a designing a new widget, whatever. All of those things are going to all impact on the products that we come up with. And that's also going to, we have to recognize sometimes that those products we make also fundamentally shift our belief system. So we have to be conscious of that, that this is a cycle and it's ongoing. Because I was trying to think of like, it's almost like if you're just difference between, again, that perpetual growth thing of like capitalism, it's like you think you can just keep consuming. And we can't always view knowledge the same way. It's like, it's not all perpetual growth and just keep getting bigger and bigger because then you just keep eating more and more. It's almost like, yeah, knowledge changes too. It grows, but it also, you know, we leave behind ideas sometimes that, huh, we don't need that idea anymore. So it's like, it may be getting bigger, but it's also it's shifting as it gets bigger. So the product of our knowledge, product of our research shifts the whole knowledge system and the beliefs of, I mean, that's why we're living cultures. It's not like we're stuck. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. <laughs> Hi, Sean. Hi. Um, is it on? Yep, yep. Um, thank you f uh, for um, uh, honoring us with your, your presentation and your ideas. And um, I really like the introduc introduction of that term indigenous because it gives permission to... Um, a wider audience, a non-Indigenous audience, to uh, adopt um, a different way of, of engaging in the world as well as doing research. And so my question has to do with um, the fact that, that uh, we live in a uh, dominant society that um, doesn't always respect this way of knowing. And we want to bring 
you know, if we use these approaches, we see the world this way, we bring this knowledge or this insight or wisdom, but the world doesn't, the, dom the, the, the mainstream world doesn't accept it because it doesn't conform to the traditional ways of documentation, of, of yep. Yep. objectivity, of separation of the researcher from the ideas and phenomena. So right. what do we do with that? Or how, what, what ideas do you have as to how to get this way of, of doing research, of knowing, um, out into the world in a way that it can be respected? Yeah, and, and that's really hard um, because I think if you're purely living in this way of engagement, it becomes really hard to understand or even what the hell are they thinking? <laughs> so I think we, we, sometimes we need to do need cultural bridges. So it's like, how can, and I think that that's oftentimes a really difficult job in trying to like work with elders. It's like, they have this way of thinking. It's like, I totally appreciate what they're saying. How can I interpret that or translate that into a way that is going to make sense? So I think oftentimes that's what I'm doing is like translating between knowledge systems. Um, or because you, you get to understand, I think, well, for me, I get to understand concepts in a non-verbal way. So it's like I understand something in my brain. Then I've got to translate it into the English language to try and share it with other people. Um, so I can imagine if like, y y so that's like a translation process going in my brain, but you've got to then take the words I'm saying and translate them in your own brain back into an idea. So there's oftentimes things lost in that translation process. But if you have whole different knowledge systems and ways of understanding, then there's going to be like real big mistranslations. And I appreciate that. So sometimes it's just a matter of you explaining yourself in 15 different ways to get across one idea. Um, like I really like talking in metaphors a lot of the time and start to think of analogies and, and stories and, and that as examples of, and, but I know that a lot of people don't understand what I'm talking about then or they don't understand the significance of telling a story that carries a metaphor that, like I probably could have told this whole thing as a, a series of stories that would have carried all this information, but I also recognize that a lot of people wouldn't have understand what I was talking about. So it's being a cultural bridge sometimes, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. And it's hard, I mean, it, it is, it, I mean, that's the big difficulty of working in academia, yeah. Like if I could just show you all my tattoos and you would understand all of this. <laughs> yes, I know. It's it's it's, it's like yes, yes. <laughs> I, I was just going to say. I think you know. I mean, it really in academia. I mean, we don't always do this or do it well, but we are cultural bridges all the time between. I mean, ideally, anyway, between disciplines, between experience. So yep. really, it's, it's a skill that we actually have. We need to cultivate it in other ways. And, yeah. you know, yeah. ultimately, our, I, you know, when you use that, the relationship with an idea, I'm thinking, yeah, because relationship, to me anyway, when I hear in that is relationship implies movement. It's not the same. A relationship, you know, an idea, you know, can be inhered in your brain, but a relationship with an idea implies that that relationship is going to evolve, change, move as, as other things, context, and, and your own thinking changes. Hmm. And it's not absolute, right? I mean, and, I mean, that's what mathematics is, is explaining relationships and numbers. But it, it, it's really good when you talk about with people that are good at math, <laughs> like I'm okay at math, but I'm not good at it. But people that are really good at it, and they just can explain it as a series of relationships, but not as absolutes, which is how most people view mathematics as absolutes. Or music. Uh, yeah. Or oh, yeah. Well, however, you're gonna do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think just unfortunately sometimes we're not very good translators. So we're good at translating our ideas to other people that have similar mindsets, but we're not necessarily as good at translating ideas to people with different ways of looking at the world. Um, I wanted to show you, okay, yep. Just, just a thought on what you um, were saying. 
I, I feel like as an indigenous student that does feel like a burden is trying to um, somehow make your research feel legitimate in the eyes of like a more Western institution or, or somehow that it needs to align, like the methodology seems to have to be this, the same or, or it has to somehow be valid in the eyes of like the, an institution when really it's more about what, what makes sense in, in the community and with the people that you are participating in the relationship with. Um, and I was just as, at a talk with Dr. James Makokis, who's a Cree um, physician, and he was talking about how he practices medicine and how he incorporates tradition and culture and traditional medicines. And, and um, I don't know if this is relevant, but one of, the, one of the health directors that was there said, well, how do you, like, what do you say to your non-Indigenous um, like colleagues about how you practice? And he said, I don't because I, I don't care, right? <laughs> and so I think that there's this, still this idea that we have to somehow now prove, prove ourselves or prove our methods or prove how we, um, you know, come to an understanding of our relationships and, and the knowledge that is being shared and then somehow then ask for permission that that's um, valid. And I found that a, a real burden in, in research is is doing that and then sharing that with with a um, Western academic university okay. that then we have to put it through the lens of ethics and um, and re and the reviews and so that's been something that's been a real challenge for me personally. But it's also something that we're used to. It's like it's not like we're not used to getting our knowledge yeah. validated. It's, it's like all of us have. Indigenous have also all had to explain ourselves to elders and they're I mean they still judge you it's it's like eh, no you don't understand that very well or so we still do get that judgment but it's like almost like we know how to incorporate it from like an indigenous way of doing things and it's like how to deal with feedback from an elder is one thing but <laughs> and we should still totally have to remain accountable to that but then it's like you get another layer on top of it of the feedback from the Western system. And so, yeah, so it's so sometimes they give opposite feedback and it's sometimes hard to make those meld. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been reframing the, the ethics. I mean, I'm on the research ethics board and I see applications all the time and I've been reframing it as uh, acting as if we belong together. So when we're looking at how we treat each other in the process and the data and the world and any of our subjects or whatever, and, and ourselves, how are we acting as if we belong together? That's kind of the lens I'm using now, and even reframing the word defense to be dialogue, because <laughs> if you're there yeah. by that point, it's, you know, it's obviously going to be a very rich discussion, mm -hmm. no matter the outcome, but you know, all those old language pieces that can hold us back from yeah. Um, making connections that I think are at the heart of what good research is, is, you know, worth kind of having a, you know, yeah. keep standing in on the, you know, being the language police maybe, or I don't know what you call it, but just being conscious of play it. play on that? Oh, Kyle, can you hit play? They're on, you have to, uh, on the screen, there should be like a play arrow on this slide. It's a video. Yeah, a video. So this is, I could have just showed, ooh. Well, just back that up one, and then you'll have to use the mouse instead of the clicker. Oh, okay. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I could have just showed this video to, uh, this is the whole presentation just in an animation. 30 second animation. But, oh well, I can show it to you some other time. Oh yeah, Living Data is, Lisa Roberts uh, works for in the Living Data Network, lives there. <laughs> she, uh, that's her website. Um, but the Living Data Network was created because, uh, obviously, it was created because uh, she works with the um, Antarctic Research Institute, and they're studying climate change all the time, and come to the realization that scientists are really shitty at explaining science, climate science, because otherwise, if, if people understood the impact of climate science, they would have we would have changed, all changed our behavior. 
So they have, they are a serious, there are people that work in Antarctic research working with artists to try and create artworks and interpretive dance, a bazillion different ways of trying to describe science through art. <laughs> so I think that's really cool. So that's why they call it living data. So it's like, so they've like the, uh, down in Antarctica, they've like repainted all of the, out, like the, their science stations, <laughs> things like that. They have a, they have a really cool video on there called Krill Sex. That's talking. So it's like a, talking about krill and how you know the krill, how krill have, whatever. So anyway, the, it's it's all in there. You can have a squiz. But um, anyway, Lisa is the. I was I was talking. She's a bungalow woman. I was talking to her one day. Oh, I have this idea about research and blah blah blah. Sure, it would be nice if someone could create a short animation for me that would describe it all. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, I guess I can. <laughs> So she created this that animation for me. But, um, Is it on this site? Yeah, somewhere on there. But. Anyway, we'll run out of time anyway. I think it's, we're already out of time. So I think the people online, if you got to go, if you got to go. And thanks for tuning in. And I think that the webinar might actually may have already finished because I think it was. One more oh, one more online question. Okay. All right, I'll just word for word, I guess. This is excellent. Um, who is in the audience for your research? Your research, and how important is it to? Sorry, how important is the concept of generalizability to the indigenous methodology? Who is in the audience? Who? I end up mostly preaching to the choir, I would say, because <laughs> people that come to listen to me usually already have a. a are already disenchanted with the Western system. So there are, I think most people that are willing to come and listen are three quarters of the way there anyway. Um, so that's who's in the audience, the choir. Uh, and generalizability, I think that, again, that goes back to the whole, that whole inductive, uh, reductive um, view of logic and how things work. So it's like, eh. To me, generalizability is a, is a big problem with reductionist science, and that's what they're always concerned with. I don't even worry about it because when you're looking at systems of how things relate, then it's all generalizable. I, I, I mean, it's, it's like a irrelevant question. I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't mean to say that your question is irrelevant. I mean, how you would, it, it, it's not something that you should need to answer in that sense. I don't know if that, so. Your question is good, but I don't say your question is irrelevant, but you should not have to answer questions about generalizability when you do indigenous research. Because it doesn't fit. Uh, but you should always have to answer questions about your objectivity and your subjectivity. You should always be reflexive. Yeah, so that's part two of the book coming out soon. Oh, yeah, where? Oh, Kyle, can you switch to the next slide? Or the second to the last? Oh, no, wait, where is it? Uh, the next slide after that one. Nope, one, one previous to that. In between, there should be one. <laughs> hey, that's, that's my new book, if you want to get my new book. And those are the sections within it. So it's talking about reconciliation. And I think that that, I really love that second section because it's like, oh, my friend Andrea uh, is one of the co-editors. Every, every year they have a no fucking Thanksgiving feast at her house. <laughs> so I think that's cool. Um, because it, 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 there's just so many indigenous people, it's just like, oh, I don't want to hear the word reconciliation. That's just meaningless. Um, and we have to accept that, that there's a lot of anger around reconciliation, right? Yeah. But it also is really tied to identity. And especially for people that are trying to enter that reconciliation space, it requires self-reflection before you enter the space.
So that's more or less the end for now. Legacy means that's enough, I guess. <laughs> it doesn't mean the end, it means that's enough. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, that's my kids again, and my wife, Helen. <laughs> again, from a million years ago. <laughs>